All right. Good morning. Good afternoon to you, Professor Barry. Here we are um, post midterm, so we've got a lot of the foundations for the class laid out: concepts, theories, ideas. Uh, now we're going to move into stratification, and focus this week is on social stratification, and then we move into race stratification and gender stratification. So these kind of, these are kind of core areas of sociology. You know, we've laid out the foundation of fear theory kind of gone from the macro to the micro, exploring some concepts, theories, ideas, and now we get into the world of stratification. So this week we are into social stratification. This will, the terms will make sense here in a minute. And basically what we're talking about when we're talking about stratification, we're talking about a layering. This is the beautiful John Day, Oregon. Um, yeah, if you're, it's, a, it's a beautiful place to be. And stratification is just basically layering, right? So in society, we have layering of different groups and they happen for different reasons. So if you kind of recall back in our kind of so perspective ideas that there's just always this complex interaction between individuals and society itself. Stratification is something that exists in societies, but it's not a product of individual people. It's a lot of stuff about culture and society and social forces that are going on. That are shaping that. So from top to bottom, why why is it that way? Like why is it stratified these layers within John Day? Why are they that far apart? How many layers are there? Uh, what are the demographics or what are the characteristics of individuals who are in those different areas? So it helps us to kind of understand better. And as with anything, the more you understand it, the more we can be in a position to um, I don't know, just understand it for its own value, but also maybe move towards social change. So the airline industry and the airport is, I think, are a great example. So you get this sort of stratification. The airport is just filled with so many great examples of stratification from the individuals who are occupying different, different um, jobs within the airport itself. Think about the number of flight attendants who are female, uh, male. We could go back into the history of kind of the flight attendants where there was a lot of gendered, uh, what we view today as being gender discrimination, that women were only females only, they had to be single, they um, were let go or fired after a certain age, uh, there, were, there was an age requirement, a height requirement, uh, it had to be single, like these kind of things that were going on. Uh, even today, 94% of, of pilots are male, it's kind of interesting, some, some stratification issues going on there. Um, then look, looking at just the airport itself, these like the TSA pre-check for those who have some spend more money up front, they can get the pre-check earlier, go through the process. We have first class, economy class, coach class, our luggage, uh, being able to go to the frequent, those who have frequent flyers or belong to a particular sky club, can, you know, it's like, all these different interesting things about stratification. And again, we're just talk, we're talking about grouping people. There are people are, are um, there's different groups in different places within society itself. And then it get ex gets expressed in, in a lot of different ways. So let's kind of define terminology, okay? So first we'll start with just sort of, we already defined stratification. It's like a ranking, a ordering, um, a layer, the layers of society itself and social stratification. Here we're talking about predominantly monetary, so class and wealth stratification. What, so economic stratification, you'd be your income, your wages, and then wealth stratification, your assets that you own, stocks, bonds, property, these kind of things. So a couple of different principles of stratification. Uh, stratification is universal. So all societies have stratification but yet it's variable. And that's an important, I think, feature to sort of attempt to recognize with stratification. It's like, okay, it's all societies have it to some degree, but let's look at the variance between countries. We can see the variance between countries, which raises the question, well, why is there variance between countries? How do we sort of understand that? Stratification is also very resistant to change. It's very sticky, just like stays stuck, right? It's like a stubborn thing. Like, you know, it's like whatever degree of stratification, um, it's very difficult to move. And usually it moves for things like advances in new technology or, um, 
yeah, new markets. Uh, we think about the development of the global marketplace, 1970s, 1980s, sort of getting increased global marketplace. We've seen an expansion of inequality across the globe um, as we become more linked in terms of market forces. And then stratification, if we have this categorization of the people based on some sort of characteristic, we have to support that by some belief system. So it's supported by ideology. Um, there's different positions or different ideas about stratification. For Marx, comp our conflict theorists, he'd say that your position in the social world in a, in a model of capitalism is based on your relationship to production. So what, what role do you occupy? Are you an owner of industry or are you a worker of it within industry? So it's this owner of production versus uh, the worker. And this has become like, this is for Marx, a major dividing line or a major way of thinking about stratification is who are the who are the owners of the systems? Who are the workers within the system? You can think about maybe who are the managers within the system. So it's it's like your relationship to the system of production. Weber had a little bit different idea, and so for Max Weber, as you know, it's like he, he's kind of like has all these different niches. So he he is an interactionist theorist, um, looking at the the process of making meaning. But then he got into the issues of of, of power and how we can understand power traditional or authority, traditional authority, legitimate authority, legal rational authority, and uh, charismatic authority. He also has this idea about, about class, class stratification. He sees there's three different elements. There's the prestige of the position, the status, the ranking. There's the um, economic component, um, the wealth component, and then there's power. So an individual, a, a master plumber makes more than a school teacher, but that job has less prestige, than, than, but the plumber has less prestige perhaps than the, uh, than the teacher. So for Weber, we have to include other things than just this sort of relationship to production. So here's some different models. We can look at different systems of stratification, and there's more than these, but these are just three sort of general systems of stratification. Sometimes think about a very rigid stratification system it would be the caste system um, in India. Uh, this caste system, there are, there are five, predominantly five different castes. Um, there was closed social mobility. There was no opportunity to move outside of the caste you were born into. Um, there was a whole ideological belief system to support uh, the caste system itself. Um, so, I mean, you have to justify this kind of a system where you have a distribution of un unequal distribution of resources and power. Um, there had to be some justification for that. And so this is one system. Let me go into a feudal system. I think about sort of monarchies, traditional based authority. Um, even a caste system would be more traditional based authority. We have the monarchy, the nobles, the knights, the peasants, the, the, the peasants, and, the, and the, the, the largest number of people are in the peasant, peasant class. This is pre-capitalism. So it's kind of a different model of in terms of stratification. And then here we have capitalism, sort of this is a new mode of production. This is a mode of production. This is a mode of production. And here at the bottom, we have the, the proletariat, the workers. This is a Marxist-based model. We have the bourgeoisie, the kind of the, um, the owners of production um, who are enjoying the fruits of all the labor of the workers. We have the military, religion, um, and we have sort of the government. And what Marx will see is that the system, the system of capitalism is the mode of production is shaping everything else underneath it. So it's kind of a different form of another form of stratification. And the book talks about, and there's some of these great examples and think about different ideas about stratification. Um, we could use the caste system and think about the caste system in India. We oftentimes think about that, but we had aspects of caste uh, system in the past as well as some people argue even today. So we're looking at Jim Crow South where we had legal segregation in the South um, and that, that was a formal caste system, caste-like system, and then this idea that the war on drugs became the sort of new Jim Crow, sort of a new element of a caste system. These are some images of, you know, when the Jim Crow South, the uh, inability, the restriction of travel for African-Americans, there actually came um, a publication called the Negro Motors, the Green Book. 
uh, film was made about this a couple of years ago. And this is a place, a guidebook for African-Americans traveling through the South, places that they could stay because they weren't allowed to stay in a lot of places of public accommodation. So, you know, if there's some cast like components of American, American in our history. This is a the development during the development of suburbs in 1950s, 1960s, restriction of movement in terms of communities, certain communities blacks were not able to live in. And so caste-like components. And then far over and going to, into Africa and um, Africa had a, apartheid, which is sort of formal caste structure system, uh, legal, I mean, our, our degrees of segregation in the United States. You could even amplify that more probably in Africa, uh, in South Africa, and this sort of march for freedom, um, this march called like, like the development of class, whether it's class consciousness, awareness, uh, protesting um, that regime of control led to, this is Nelson Mandela, who Nelson Mandela led the, the, led the way for breaking down that caste system. Um, think about like redlining this idea of drawing. If you ever heard that concept before, uh, I have a uh, my book over here is called The Color of Law. If you're interested in this area, it's um, probably came out, I don't know, five years ago, four years ago. Basically, so the color of law, like a map drawn over a certain area, a certain area of a city, a town, and banks would not loan money to people with, within that particular area. Um, they tend to be areas that were predominantly people of color within that area. So people of color who even wanted to leave that area were, you know, were restricted in their ability to leave that area because banks wouldn't loan money to people to buy their property. So just this vicious sort of thing that created a lot of impact, not only in the past, but all the way through kind of the accumulation of wealth today. So there's like very formal things going on. So let's go to the idea that it's principle, but one of the first principle, it's universal, uh, but variable. So this is a, the, Gini, uh, the Gini coefficient, G-I-N-I. -I. The Gini coefficient is the measure of degree of inequality. So perfect inequality would be as get a score of one. Uh, perfect, yeah, perfect inequality, a score of one. Perfect equality would be a score of zero. And so this is just like one measurement of uh, degree, degree of inequality. And, what, and one thing I just, you know, the numbers aren't important here, but rather the relationships between different, different countries. And to illustrate, that yeah, it's variable, right? Um, the United States is 0.39 uh, in terms of the Gini coefficient. So we're fairly highly stratified compared to a lot of other countries. Uh, this, this sort of brings up the question, you know, like, well, why, why is it, are we stratified this particular way? Stratification, I try to encourage this sort of idea that stratification is not inevitable, uh, that, or at least the degree of stratification is not inevitable, that these are decisions these are things that are being shaped by, things that are, are shaping the degree of that stratification. So it's universal and variable. Another way we can see this is degree of social mobility. There's mobility movement up and down a class-based system or a hierarchy. You have intra-generational intra mobility, like within one person's generation. So one's own life, the degree to which they move up and down the hierarchy. You have a cross generation, intergenerational mobility is another measure, like you know, one's parents versus oneself versus one's offspring. Like, what's the degree of social mobility? And the idea of the American dream, right, is this idea of social mobility. People worked hard enough, they can get themselves to any any economic position. Well, we can look at the degree of of social mobility. The countries that are actually the the most socially mobile tend to be the Nordic countries. And they go all the way through, you know you know, Canada, Japan, Australia, all these different countries, United Kingdom, New Zealand, we're fairly, compared to a lot of industrialized countries, we're, we're fairly low on the degree of social mobility. So think about this for a minute, you know, this idea of like, it has to be supported by ideology, right? So for many Americans, we really believe that if you just work hard enough, you can be, you can achieve anything you want, want to. Well, that, that reality is actually more relevant or more likely in all these other countries versus the United States. We pride ourselves, this sort of ideal culture, so recall that from earlier in the term, the ideal culture about stratification, the way we think about it versus the practice culture, the reality of it itself. Now, maybe one of the reasons for this degree of stratification would be things like, well, what's the tax rate? Uh, what are the, the marginal, the average tax rate for, for um, in society? 
And we can see that that's mobile, that moves across time, the taxation for the top 1%, for the top 10%, for the top 20, 40, 60, on down, that there's, it's movable. And those are political calculations. Those are, those are done by, through our political process. So it's not inevitable, but it's very calculated. This is, I think, another interesting chart. The, the total tax revenue, the amount of revenue generated by taxes as a percentage, as a share of all sales and production or all services and, and production. So it's the gross domestic product, GDP. So it's basically just look at, okay, how productive a country is and then what's their total tax revenue based on that level of production? And we're relatively low. This is probably why, like, in, you know, in all these other countries here, there's a greater social safety nets, more investment in the public good, more investment in public resources. We are much more individualistic in nature, this sort of idea of free market ideology and belief. Um, and those are ideologies and beliefs. Those aren't uh, the reality of how things have to be. They're the way things have been decided to be. Um, kind of perspective. You think about the social construction of reality a little bit of how we constructing reality. If you look at the, uh, the, the tax rate for the for billionaires, um, when you look at it over a course of time in 1960, if the uh, 400 wealthiest families, what they're paying in terms of tax rate, where it is today, it's like, wow, that's quite a change, right? So what's the consequence of that particular change? I thought this was a kind of interesting chart. Our world and data is a great resource site for looking at all kinds of different social indicators within the countries and across countries. And what this kind of like for, for when I saw this is just looking up different things like, okay, this is kind of interesting, right? There's a trend, a very consistent trend across you know, quite a few countries, this U-shaped thing about of inequality that during 1920s, 1929, you know, the stock market crash, the Great Depression in the United States, but that was a worldwide that had worldwide implications. Um, degree of inequality was declining um, all the way until about 1980. And this is where we don't have to talk about this terminology, but just introduce this terminology. The rise and development of neoliberalism, um, of new economic policies, new ideologies, new beliefs. It's also the development of computer, more advanced computer uh, processing, automation, the expansion of global markets. Then we see this rise in development of inequality around the world. So this is not only in the United States, but around uh, the world, but it is variable as well, right? So there's a trend there um, that's consistent across a lot of countries, but there's variability even within that. Um, and then other countries had something a little bit different, where instead of a U-shaped curve, then you have these other countries that's more of an L-shaped curve. It drops down, starting to rise a little bit, but not sort of this really big swing that the United States, Australia, United Kingdom, other countries experienced. So I don't know, just another interesting sort of way to sort of think about that. I find it fascinating, like Amazon um, paid no federal taxes, for, you know, for, for a long time. 2016 was the first time they paid federal taxes, but then even then their tax bill was really small, 1.2% of their overall profit. It's like, yeah, well, you know, what's, how do you explain that? How do we understand that? I think in part, we have to get into ideologies. So ideology is the lens through which a person views the world. So it's, it shapes the way we view the world. Ideology is the sum total of our values, our beliefs, our assumptions. And we know through socialization, those values, beliefs, and assumptions are shaped by our social group, our social position, the culture that we are in. Ideology is, exists within society itself, within, within so different social groups within society and within in the indiv individual. It shapes, if you go back to the Thomas theorem, if you define it's real, it's real and its consequences. Uh, if we go back to this idea of even an interactionist-based perspective, before we act, we think. So there's the, the, the objective world, but before we get to the response, it's our interpretation of the objective world. So ideology is this place where we're interpreting things that are going on that leads to certain decisions and outcomes. So if I were to go back and think about you know, the tax rate of, of billionaires. What's the ideology to support that? Why did it go down? There had to be some justification and support for that particular um, change in that shift. And it's how we interpret the accumulation of wealth and the redistribution of wealth. It's like, it's like where does our interpretive filter come from? Uh, it's something that we had to be socialized into. 
So Gramsci, if, uh, we, this is a long time ago, probably week three, we talked, there was a mention of Gramsci and Gramsci had this idea that of hegemony, domination by consent. So if we have a, if we have a system of stratification where you have a gap between top and bottom, let's say it's, it's grown what we've known since the 1980s, right? That gap between the top and the bottom has grown further and further apart. And really that top 1% and even a fraction of that top 1%, the point 1% has really expanded. So it's got further and further differentiation. So for Gramsci, you know, ideology is domination by consent. The majority of people live here numerically. Well, why are the majority of people supporting the system of expanding inequality? For Gramsci, it's like, well, they, they believe into, they believe in things that are against their own social, economic, personal interest. So this idea for Gramsci would be that a lot of Americans believe that if you just work hard enough, you'd be able to make it in the world. And that minimizes the complexity of the social world, also minimizes the role that social structure plays. And that holding on to that belief system just reinforces that system of inequality. It's against one's own self-interest, you know, to advocate for, de for decreasing the tax rate for the top 1% for the majority of Americans, but yet we, but yet majority, you know, but yet we, we do that, right? We're without politicians to we support politicians in, in changing that. So that's, we are basically reinforcing that system, us as individuals in the, in the, in the uh, who don't have that economic, social, political power, we're believing things, ideologies that support that particular system. Part of it may be, and this becomes an interesting concept or idea, this just world hypothesis, part of it may be, that there's a tendency that people view that the world is a just place. And there's a lot of interesting research about this going back across time. It's been pretty well established that, that uh, we think that when good things happen to people, it's because these individuals are good and deserving. And if bad things happen, it's because they're undeserving. Um, and this is, we, it ends up, leads us to blaming the victim sometimes. So if people are not, um, movie, if they're in poverty, we tend to see that through that very individualistic lens. We think, well, if they're in poverty, they had equal opportunity, they had opportunity to get there, they chose, chose not to, it's their moral character or their work ethic that's, that's limiting them to get to that particular place. Well, that's sort of this world is just, and if there's inequality, it's because people aren't doing what they need to do in order to get themselves out of that situation. So Zick Rubin of Harvard, Harvard University and Letitia Ann Poplau of UCLA have conducted surveys to examine the characteristics that pe people have strong beliefs in a just world. People have a strong tendency to believe in a just world, also tend to be more religious, more authoritarian, more conservative, more likely to admire political leaders and existing institutions, and more likely to have negative attitudes towards underprivileged groups. To a lesser but still significant, significant degree, the believers in a just world tend to feel less of a need to engage in activities to change society. So much more of an individualistic uh, perspective. Adorno, who's kind of like, you know, is a Marxist theorist, um, said there are no more ideologies in the authentic sense of false consciousness, only advertisements for the world through its duplication and the provocative lie, which does not seek belief, but commands silence. That's kind of a pretty powerful kind of quote that um, that the ideologies that we're gaining today that we that are supporting the system of inequality may not come from the source same similar same sources that it did prior to let's say the 1950s and the rise of kind of this commercial market after the 1950s. Now through advertising, marketing, I mean our, our ideologies are are being shaped by a lot of different uh, powerful forces. How closely does our beliefs about social mobility match reality? We have these beliefs, you know, used to be the example like Oprah Winfrey or others, people who go from rags to riches, that rags to riches story, um, that hard work people can get there. Our perceptions don't really match reality. So we overestimate the degree of social mobility. We overestimate the degree to which individual work and effort is the reason why people are in the situation they're in, in terms of class. Um, and there's political differences in terms of how Republicans and Democrats tend to see that. So more affluent people are more likely to attribute wealth to personal effort. So, okay, let's look at income level and perceptions 
a personal effort and degree of influence of personal effort. So people who make more money tend to say that, well, people who are rich made more money or, or worked harder to get there. That's kind of interesting to explore just for a moment too and think about, well, you know, if you've, if you've you know, been working 60 hours a week, right? And you're, you finally make that or 40, 50 hours a week, you know, and the sacrifices to get there and you're making $100,000 a year um, as an individual, start to see, well, you know, I worked really hard to get there. And I think in some ways, if we're not connected to different groups, we don't understand their experience. We don't understand their experience. So the person who's making $40,000 a year may be working even harder, but may have different resources available to them to get to move into a different social position. Uh, why a person is poor tends to be that individuals um, who are lower. So the further you go up in terms of stratification, again, sort of view it, it's just people aren't working hard enough. Um, for those go further down, it's like recognizing the structural kind of reality. So this is tough, right? It's like figuring out what's that interplay between the individual and society itself and political differences between Republican, between conservatives and liberals, between political parties, Republican and Democrat, see this issue in a different way. Republicans, conservatives tend to see it as, a, as an effort issue, working hard, where uh, Democrats tend to see it more likely at, or see it as through a lens of social structure, opportunities, system level kind of things. Um, but that changes across time as well. I thought this was kind of an interesting chart about even how things change across time. Um, Republicans attribute wealth to working harder rather than having greater advantages in life. And um, yeah, who say a person is poor because of their lack of effort. And it's kind of, well, it's gone up, kind of gone down just even like over a four year time period, it's variable. This one is really one, kind of interesting to me. The percent who say a person is generally, is rich generally because they worked harder seen a real significant inf increase over a 17 year time period of the focus on sort of hard work is, is the, uh, the reason for that. Man, I mean, that, things don't change that fast in terms of public attitude and perspective. And so it's like, what's going on makes you kind of wonder. This research is a little bit dated. They haven't re redone it in a while, but I thought I wanted to introduce it because it's, um, it kind of illustrates the sort of idea of kind of American uh, individualism um, and how we compare to other um, developed economies. So we, we are an outlier. We see things that overall in terms of general American values and ideals that we see that success is pretty much um, who disagree that success is determined by things outside of one's control. And we kind of oppose that idea that success is in your control, right? So we tend to be very much this idea of that individual, uh, rugged ind individualist perspective. Per percent who say it's very important to work hard to get ahead of life, we're, we're way out here. So we are pulled in that direction. Uh, there's a long history in the United States, Horatio Alger stories, these dime, these dime book novels, uh, who uh, basically told us rags to riches ideology and perspective. I mean, it's deeply rooted in American history and culture and film. Um, and that, this is a Dr. Seuss Theo, Theodore Gazelle, who uh, really has an interesting, not, you know, outside of green eggs and ham, you know, and all these other one fish, two fish, red fish, red fish blue fish, and all these other great Dr. Seuss books. A lot of stuff that was really critiquing society, um, very strong socialist leanings for, uh, for Dr. Seuss, um, yeah, and sees, you know, sort of bringing to our attention, you know, sort of the structural forces going on there. So look at Jeff Bezos, uh, CEO of, of Amazon. And um, 2019, uh, you know, I was preparing this lecture. I wanted to look, just get sort of what is the more recent number in terms of total wealth for Bezos. 110 in 2019, two years later, he's 191 billion in terms of overall, um, yeah, in terms of his wealth. It's like, wow, and then if you can read through this, but you know, to, to, to break through the idea that it's Jeff Bezos because he's worked really hard, that's why he has that amount of wealth. I think a more reasonable conclusion is that, yeah, he's worked hard and he has a skill set that's very valuable. Um, he, uh, 
There's a lot. So there's things that, that are part of him that's merit based, but there's a lot of things that are outside of that, that are driving that as well. And it's being sensitive and aware and trying to, to tease out the degree of influence of the individual. And then also thinking about that social, cultural, larger environment. So let's get into some theories of stratification and we'll kind of come back to that maybe. Um, so just real quick, the functionalist perspective on stratification is that stratification exists in all societies, therefore it must have a function. One of the functions of stratification, the Davis Moore thesis is that we, by having differential rewards, different income for different positions, it encourages people to work harder uh, for to, to move forward and move ahead. So there's this functional aspect to having inequality. Um, inequality is also a way of reflecting cultural values. So the jobs that are more functionally important are getting compensated at a higher rate than other jobs. This would be the logic and the idea. So someone who's working, let's say, in the healthcare system, different pay for different, different positions, and it's because those positions have greater functional value from the Davis Moore thesis would be the idea. Um, and one of the limitations of this model is that while theoretically you can say, okay, well, that makes sense. There's going to be some degree of stratification. It's based on, to some degree, the functional importance of the job, but it can't reason through very well, well, why that degree of differential rewards? Why the, phys phys you know, the physician and family practice at 200,000 versus the nurse at 76? How far, like, how do we explain the degree of stratification uh, across things. The average CEO versus the average worker is an interesting one. Back in the 1970s in the United States, the average CEO, the average worker was somewhere around, I think, 50 to 1, 40 to 60 to 1. Uh, now we're up at 270 to 1. Um, it was higher the diff, you know, over the last 10, 15 years. Um, so how do we explain the degree of stratification? And the Davis Moore thesis can't do that very well. Conflict theory gets us into the, mean, the relationship to means of production. Um, well, degree of stratification in one part maybe is labor organized. Does, do, do people in labor have a voice? You look at Sweden, Canada, other places, their labor union, their labor union membership is much higher. In the United States, our membership is around 10, 11% for labor union. And most of that comes out of the public sector stuff, teachers, firefighters, law enforcement. Um, it's not in the private sector, which is really just kind of really telling and informative, I think in a lot of ways. Paid vacation days in the United States or zero mandated paid vacation days in the United States, zero paid maternity leave in the United States compared to other countries. Uh, universal health care exists in you know, a lot of different places in the United States, no. Uh, the Gini coefficient degree of stratification, uh, much higher in the United States. And then this idea of tokenism, like that one person makes it, they become a token, like that one person makes it, or we celebrate the story of the individual who made it. And that kind of like focuses on, well, they made it, everybody else can make it too. Therefore, you know, they worked harder, they made it happen. This is the idea of tokenism. So that's, those are two different theories, functionalism, conflict theory. Another theory, which I think is a really interesting one, is this idea from Pierre Bourdieu. This idea that things are being socially reproduced. Um, through socialization, our family background and our family experience, we're developing either social capital, networking. So it's the people that we know. And we can exchange the people that we know. It's capital. Like I know individuals who work in that industry. I know people or I know my parents know people who work in that industry. And I can exchange that capital for getting in that in into that industry. Uh, whatever it may be, or within that school, or all these different kinds of things. So social capital, and then cultural capital are the things that we know. It could be our, our attitude, our language, our communication style, our disposition, our experiences, the places we vacation. I mean, all these different things are cultural capital that we exchange in terms of for, for positions. And you can check out a video. There's a lot of videos on board to you. Um, I don't know, this is just one. I can't show it here, but if you want, you can check it out, social reproduction. And Annette LaRue had in her work of Unequal Childhoods is the title of the book, really fascinating where she's doing some ethnographic uh, work where she kind of her research methods is to spend time in different families in different classes. Uh, and a little bit about racial, racial differences as well, um, in terms of some of the families that she spends a lot of time with. And what she kind of walks away with is that in a middle class 
professional middle-class family, there's a lot of work on concerted, what she calls concerted cultivation. A lot of time in trying to cultivate certain value skills, ideals, um, life experiences, um, plugging into clubs and organizations, bands, sports, uh, developing, very focused on cultivating certain things to position kids in a place to get to certain colleges and certain, eventually certain economic opportunities. So very structured, think about the helicopter parent, think about this for very concerted cultivation about launching a kid in a certain direction. Natural growth is what she identifies for more working class families, give ch children have more autonomy, more freedom, and that, that there's more, they have a greater ability to grow naturally versus this real concerted cultivation molding someone in a certain direction. So really interesting, right? And that this sort of social reproduction, like, you know, we are through our work in terms of being a parent and our family and our structure that we are reproducing stratification. Um, it's a different way of thinking about stratification. And it becomes interesting to too, think about the sort of cultural logic of parenting as LaRue says that neither type of parenting is better than the other. Um, in fact, there's a lot of advantages of the natural growth, but in terms of economic long-term opportunity, that there's more economic advantage with the concerted cultivation. So guys, we got different theories, right? So now we kind of move into, well, what's an ideology that we have that helps to maintain that degree of stratification? So this ideology, this belief system. And for us, it's predominantly the myth of merit, the idea of meritocracy. Merit is the things that you've done. So you've, you've the, the, the types of work you've done, your work ethic, uh, your level of education. It's all of your contributions, like as your merit, the more merit you have, you exchange that for more resources. That's the idea. Um, and the reality is that that's an incomplete story. So we put a lot, we say that, well, you know, stratification in the United States is there the way that it is because of merit for those who it's a, re, it's a reflection of the rewards for those who've sacrificed the most and have worked the hardest. It's really interesting that idea of meritocracy or merit-based systems doesn't emerge until the 1950s um, in the UK. And actually it had a very derogatory connotation in the 1950s. Um, and it, it was viewed that at that time there was sort of you know, growing inequality in the UK and there was a critique and this idea that was emerging is that you know, that merit was being upheld as this thing that that is the reason why stratification exists the way that it does. And it had this sort of very negative connotation um, that people were critiquing it even even then. Um, so I don't know, just a little bit about that that term, just to re realize that term didn't always exist, and now it exists in a context where we see it not as um, and we see it as a set that becomes our dominant ideology, our dominant explanation for our level of stratification. Think about the, the immigrant story. So Michael Sandel, um, there's a podcast, The Tyranny of Merit, really fascinating, interesting. He's a Harvard, um, Harvard University professor, I believe, political science. He's done a lot of work, got another book of, book of his called Justice, which is really fascinating. Just think about how we think about justice. Um, and just really just kind of very methodical and thinking through these kind of complex issues. He talks about in, in uh, the tyranny of merit, this about the immigration story, about the, let's say an immigrant comes to America or another country and they, they, they make it, right? They go from the bottom, no education, all the way to a more prominent position. And we tell the story, like he talks about it, we tell the story of the person was self-made versus this idea of gratitude to be thankful for the sacrifices let me kind of back up a second. So an immigrant family comes over, a kid from that family makes it. So self-made, we face this idea that, okay, the kid worked really hard, made that happen. So that there, it's not to deny that that individual worked hard, but rather the sense of gratitude that is also an important part um, or focus, that gratitude for one's parents, for immigrating to the United States and the support maybe even in the, in the, the homeland country, the support, to be able to get the parents to even come to the United States. Like we, we're standing, we all stand on the shoulders of, of giants. You know, we all stand on the shoulders and influenced by others. That meritocracy story is so individual. It removes that examination of all those other social forces. 
so it, in this case, the immigrant story, it removes from our focus on understanding all the sacrifices of different generations or people or in people's lives. Uh, the sense of, of responsibilities we have to ourselves and to others in our community that, you know, if we see it all through this lens of the individual, if I did it all on my own, these are my rewards. I have no obligation back to the community itself. So that's kind of one of the consequences of sort of this rugged individualist, uh, individualistic and, and meritocratic kind of way of thinking. Politicians' response to globalization and increased inequality fail, fails to address the inequalities in the job market. Um, so we've had globalization, which is create that, that u shape chart uh, from earlier, growing inequality and meritocracy myth idea reinforces and justifies that kind of thing, right? It doesn't allow space for examining the more structural elements um, of those of that that degree of inequality. There's also like a lot of luck. Um, you know, people society rewards people for the talents they have. And that's in part kind of luck. Um, let me just give you an example. Maybe this is kind of a corny example or a little, um, I don't know, but think about somebody who's an amazing badminton player, um, but in a country that doesn't value badminton. Uh, somebody who has skills in terms of being an artist, an amazing artist, um, amazing photographer, but within a particular cultural environment, like those, those skills are not rewarded to the same degree. Uh, there's not value placed on them. So it's like sometimes it's just luck, happen chance that a person's skills and abilities and desires and their, their, their talent lines up with what's valued within culture and society itself. Initiative drive ambition, they're valuable virtues. The assumption from the meritocracy idea is that those that are higher up have more of those qualities and those below do not. Um, this belief reinforces and justifies the inequality itself. Um, and I just find this interesting, this idea, this, this, this chart here, this idea of merit, right? It'd be hard to reconcile if you really believe like fully it's just based on merit. Then like, well, how do you wrestle with this? That here's the top, based on the income bracket of what school individuals went to, what kind of school did they go to? Um, and, you know, from sort of top tier Ivy schools, when we see the, the class distribution, if you look at the top 20%, the amount of, you know, that come from the top 20% um, and elite, you see, they I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a difference in the kind of universities and kind of college and kind of experience. Think about, go back to Bordeaux and social capital and cultural capital. You know, it's not only going to these institutions, it's like what, and not only the content of what's learned in the classroom, but it's like networking and opportunities, you know, it's like all these different things that are going on. And people can work really hard in any of these different places. This person may be from the, from the second quintile, the, like the bottom 40%, may work extremely hard to get it, much more harder than a person here to get a degree, but yet you know, they, they have different opportunities available to them uh, down the road. So this idea of a myth of meritocracy, well, who has more merit? This is kind of a, just an example I came up with. So let's say you grew up in the, five, you know, the top 5% private schools, you have a lot of capital, uh, lived in a cultural soup of white collar professionalism. You became a physician, worked in a private medical clinic, grew up in the bottom 5%, worked really hard, a lot of advanced coursework, a lot of stresses in the community, ended up becoming a physician and you work both at a public clinic serving those with high needs in a private committed, you know, private clinic. Well, who has more merit? You know, what do we value? I think it's sort of a, a key question with that. Is Jeff Bezos self-made? Is it based on merit? Uh, what if Bezos was a person of color? To what degree would that have an influence? Uh, what if he grew up in poverty? To what degree would that would, would that have an influence? What if he grew up he grew up in rural rural uh, North Dakota? Uh, what, what would that how would that make a difference? So I think you know by focusing only on the individual, we lose an opportunity to have, to understand in a more to have a sociological imagination to go to to see Wright Mills of that interplay between the individual and society itself. And for Sandel, part of it is there's a danger to the to this idea of meritocracy in the sense if we believe it to that extent then we lose the ability to have humility empathy and understanding and gratitude for uh for others um gratitude for others who have influenced us who have supported us and it just becomes sort of way too individualistic in nature this is kind of a chart to kind of go after a lot of we've been talking about here um maybe i'll bring it up in class we won't really spend a lot of time talking about it here but just wanted to kind of identify the way that we think about stratification, you know, from the bottom to the top, 
that there's a lot of stuff going on about cultural meanings, about how we understand stratification, uh, our social position that we're born into, and what kind of opportunities or limitations are provided by being born in a certain position, just kind of resources that are available to us. The meanings that we attribute for those who are above and below, where does that come from? How do we think about issues of fairness? How, and then how do we more objectively ultimately measure the relationship between individual and social forces? So go back to the strange and the familiar for a second. Like we live in this world that's in the United States that has a value of strong, strong uh, rugged individualism and meritocracy. Strange and the familiar is take the common everyday stuff and start asking questions about it. Not to be disruptive, uh, not to be difficult or a pain in the butt, but rather to become more aware, uh, become more aware and then to be more empowered to think through more critically this relationship between the individual and society itself. All right, theme number five, is looking at limits of this sort of individual level of analysis. So historically back, there's been different ideas about, I don't know, about this sort of individual, this individualism and this sort of ideas and the, you know, trying to, um, yeah, provide different perspectives. And one perspective that for at first it may seem like, oh, this is outside of the individual's perspective. This gets us into more structural kind of things. And it's like, well, not really. And that's the cultural of poverty idea. So Oscar Lewis, who, interviewed and spent a lot of time with uh, different immigrant families. Um, and what he identified is that it is that there's a culture of poverty, that people who grow up in poverty, develop values, beliefs, and attitudes that keep them, more likely keep them in that particular position. So it's kind of like blaming not the individual, but it's here it's blaming the family. And the challenge of that perspective is say, well, if you grow up in poverty, you know, you learn your work ethic isn't as strong and all these different kinds of things. The problem with that or limitation with that analysis or critique of that analysis is that it's removing families from understanding them in a, in a cultural and structural context. It's like, well, if you are in poverty, you may not be saving money for the future because you don't have money to save for the future. So in this case, which one comes first? Is it the poverty comes first or is it this sort of value of about saving money? Um, you know, there's a relationship and this idea of culture of poverty thesis really became a predominant view in the United States in the 1960s and 1970s. And then it got become just critiqued more and more. This idea that we're just moving it from blaming the individual. Now we're just kind of moving it to blaming kind of like the family or a group uh, who's in poverty. Uh, we also have like such so one kind of example, I guess, of limitation of that individual's perspective and sort of some, you know, the cultural poverty thesis tend to reinforce that individual perspective through the family. And we have like a history in the United States with, with eugenics, good genes, this idea of building a stronger community through genetic control, ideas about people who are feeble-minded or intellectual capability, um, poverty, alcohol, other different kinds of moral social problems that people viewed it through this lens of eugenics. It's because they're, they're bad genes. And so we can, we can create a stronger society through controlling the genetic pool within society itself. I mean, it's like, you know, that's it's in the led of the United States to involuntary sterilization of 60 to 70,000 people, people of color, Native Americans, you know, individuals who are identified as being feeble-minded. The sort of like this very, got us into that space so rather than addressing the, structural realities, it just all got focused on sort of the individual and it led to a really dangerous place, right? This idea that it must be the genes that are causing um, the social problems and the social issues themselves. And that still hasn't gone away. This is a little bit dated book, uh, The Bell Curve uh, by Charles Murray and Richard Hernstein. And I believe this book probably came out, if our memory serves me correct, like mid 1980s. So it's been 30 some years, almost 40 years, since, well, probably 40 years since it's, since it's release. But the argument in the bell curve, sorry to keep on moving that around, but the argument in the bell curve was this idea that um, certain communities, so, so were certain people of color, certain groups, uh, certain minority groups are more likely to be successful than others, uh, or minority groups, let, let me restate that, that whites were more, likely to be financially successful and achieve success uh, compared to um, people of color 
and that that had to do with these inborn characteristics and traits in part. Um, and they kind of went about this work of trying to establish looking at IQ, educational outcome and different factors to create an argument and perspective that it's basically kind of genetically determined and shaped within that, you know, it's basically a biological kind of mechanism and an argument. So I bring up eugenics sometimes, not as like, you know, I think we need to understand the past to help make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. This is like eugenics. I think a lot of people that critique would say this is eugenics light. It's not as quite as direct, but it's still there. And it's still within our culture itself. I mean, we just like hold on to these kind of ideas sometimes. So I go back to our theme here, right? So the limits of this sort of individual kind of perspective. And we can kind of get into like things like, you know, think about the way we think about welfare. Uh, we view it through that lens, that individualistic perspective. And sometimes we don't even have the knowledge of like, well, what is poverty? What is the poverty line? What, what is welfare? Like we, we develop, I think it's really powerful. Like we have these convictions uh, or beliefs and these attitudes, these ideologies that we develop about welfare and what it is without even knowing what it is, right? So socialization, we've learned this from culture itself. And um, I don't know, you just kind of go down the list here, think about it. And I think most people don't know, you know, poverty line to be in poverty, family of four, $26,000 a year to be in poverty, uh, to receive benefits, um, you know, about one quarter of individuals who are in poverty or families are in poverty receive benefits. There's a lifetime limitation, five years over a course of one's lifetime, uh, at least from a federal level to receive benefits. Uh, for a family of three, the benefit is 500, basically 500 bucks a month in the state of Oregon. Um, so this idea that people are living off of welfare is just a misconception of the realities of welfare. But I find it fascinating that we can develop these very strong convictions without having, having any real understanding of what welfare is itself. And then the final um, theme here is looking at the structural social mobility, this concept. So rather than thinking about individual social mobility, social mobility, let's look at that structure, like the whole structure of society is moving. It's always moving, right? The structures never stay the same. They're, they're moving, sometimes more dynamically than in other time periods. So if we, if we look at the degree of inequality in the United States and the growing inequality in the United States, this is a, a, a reflection of a structural shift, not individual level um, contribution or lack of contribution. So one way you could look at this, say, starting in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, where deindustrialization, manufacturing sector in American society starts to go down, service-oriented jobs start to go up. Manufacturing jobs were tend to be more high union, there was union representation. Uh, service-oriented jobs, less union representation, so less labor, labor has less of a voice. Um, so we're moving to different kinds of jobs that we're doing. We still have a manufacturing sector, but not as much as we did before. So we have a shift in the economy. Globalization is going on. So we're, rather than producing in the United States, we're producing more, other countries are producing and we're importing those goods from other countries. So certain cities and, and communities were adversely impacted by that large structural shift, where communities that had real economic opportunity, there was relatively high employment with uh, living wage jobs in those communities. You know, the, when those jobs left, this is the idea of when work disappears by William Julius Wilson, when jobs disappear in places like Baltimore, Detroit, Chicago, um, and other city centers that had a strong manufacturing base or steel or lumber in the case of Oregon and tightrope with Nicholas Kristof, when certain industries leave, um, you know, and jobs go away, it's, it's a structural social shift that happens and it impacts people within the community. It could be a result of the technological changes, more automation within industry. Think about globalization, but not only it's just that markets are more interrelated, but also trade policies that are favoring uh, import export, favoring certain industries over others. Um, there's a lot, I think you could argue, I think there's a lot of evidence to support that American Trade policies really adversely affected a lot of workers in the United States. You know, we opened up more and more movement of goods across borders. We built maquiladores or factories along the U.S.-Mexico border, bringing in goods and services, shifting manufacturing to different locations that had an impact on industries in the United States and jobs in the United States. Politicians were not 
protecting jobs in the United States. We lost those jobs um, and communities were impacted by that. So it's, here in that conversation, it's not about the individual, right? This is all about things that are much more macro level kind of processes and macro level things. Mm -hmm. If you look at the minimum wage, even like, you know, we until recently, and we were not keeping up with the minimum wage, you know, back in the 1980s, 1990s, didn't keep up with inflation. So sort of just you know, the structure was not moving with those dynamics and so in what was going on in terms of change. And then finally, um, the gap between the top and the bottom is rising and the share held by the middle income is falling. So what basically illustrating here is that the structural social shift is really pulled the higher groups further apart from the middle class even and the lower. And really the concentration of wealth and income has gone further and further into the top 5%, top 1%, and even a fraction of the top 1%. So it's this really kind of shift that's been going on over the last 30, 40 years that's created a lot of struck, a lot of challenges and for, for people's lives and within the community itself. I think an interesting examination of structural social change, I may have mentioned this in class before, it's HBO film called Our Towns where um, Bend, Oregon is profiled. And it's basically a story about towns that um, were struggling and then they reinvented themselves. And usually it's a story, a lot of these towns, it's a story about deindustrialization and what they did afterwards. It's stories about declining economic support within the community, the, the economy is not very vital, and these communities reinvent themselves and become something, um, they develop a new economy, and they become these towns that are growing and developing, and there's real economic vitality in these communities. And you can see that in Central Oregon, Oregon think about it in Bend, of the old mill to going from a productive mill to you know, new economy, right? It's this new economy of service-oriented jobs, healthcare, travel, tourism, all these different components. Um, and, the, and not every town has that kind of journey and that experience. And the book Tightrope, uh, based out of Nicholas Kristof and his growing up, I believe is Oregon City or Yamhill over in the Valley, um, that you know, a lot of jobs left his community uh, for a lot of different manufacturing jobs, the mill, a lot of things went on. And when he was growing up there, those jobs were still there. And he kind of, he, you know, is very, the community, there's a lot of support in the community, a lot of resources in the community, relatively low rates of poverty and drug and alcohol problems in the community itself. Fast forward 30, 40 years later, he goes back to visit the town, go back, back to visit friends. And he just sees this place of, much more high levels of desolate, desolate lives and desolation um, struggle uh, because the economy is fundamentally different than it was before. Uh, so that's that structure that example of structural social mobility. All right, so we, are, we won't go through all this, but if you want to kind of, kind of look through, maybe we'll talk about this in class. Um, all right, so that sounds good. That's it for now. So got those themes. Um, hope you're, everything's going well for you. Keep me posted if you have any questions. And if not, see you in class. Have a great day.